start to talk. I don't think, as I said, I don't think we need to keep on introducing you so much. We all know you. So please, start your talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chan. So I'm sharing the screen now. Is it full screen? Yes. Okay. You can speak um, very well. Okay. Thank you again, uh, Abget, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. I just realized that uh, this topic of mine that I'm going to speak will probably be elaborated by other speakers, other subsequent speakers. So I'm just going to give an overview of what are the tips and tricks of performing laparoscopic surgery on a large uterus. Now, the first question I would like to ask is, what is the definition of a large uterus? Um, this is a difficult definition. Generally, people think that if a fibroid is more than 500 grams, then that is considered a large uterus. And uh, so why is the uterus large? Generally, we know the uh, uterus is large because of two conditions, that is fibroids and adenomyosis. And adenomyosis is probably a more difficult surgery than a fibroids, as I will, I will uh, discuss a, 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 in a little while. Now, why... What laparoscopic surgeries do we do on a large uterus? Now, today's symposium is basically on laparoscopic hysterectomy, but I have designed this lecture to cover also laparoscopic myomectomy and laparoscopic adenomyomectomy because uh, we do this kind of surgeries on large uteruses. So whatever tips that I'm going to say will apply to all these three different techniques. Now, what, are, what factors affect a surgery to be accomplished laparoscopically? Now, there are, uh, besides the size of the uterus, the other factors that are important are the size of the patient, the location of the fibroid, adhesions, endometriosis, especially deep interfibrillatory and, and, uh, uh, endometriosis, previous caesarean sections, and of course, finally, the skill of the patient. Let me just quickly go through all these factors. The first is the size of the patient. Uh, all of you all know that if you have a 1 kg fibroid on this lady, it will be probably very much easier to do than on, on this lady. Actually, the space that you have in the abdomen is probably more important than actually the size of the, uh, the, the uterus or the fibroid. So in, in a very petite lady, even a, a 600 gram uh, uterus may be difficult because there's no space to work. The second factor is the location of the fibroids. Um, when, we, when the fibroid is situated at the fundal region, even if it is a two kilogram fibroid, it is easy to do because the, most of the difficulties when we do laparoscopic hysterectomies at the area of the uh, isthmus and beyond, that is the area that we will have difficulties. Fundal area is usually easy, but if you have a, fi a fibroid that is situated in the cervical region, then that is going to be a problem. Now, the next uh, uh, situation is if you have a, a fibroid that is situated, say, around this area of fibroid, that is a cervical fibroid, even if it is not that large, then this is going to be uh, a difficult surgery. The third is adhesions. Now, if you have a large uterus and also you have a lot of adhesions, like what you see in these patients, in this, in this, in this, uh, no, sorry, I, I go behind again. Uh, like in this lady, if you have a large uterus and also all the bowel is adherent, then the surgery is going to be difficult. So additions also play a role in your success in performing surgery in a big uterus. Of course, the most difficult thing is endometriosis. I, I always say that the most difficult surgeries are the large uteruses with adenomyosis associated with endometriosis and deep infiltrative endometriosis. And these are difficult cases to do uh, uh, for uh, difficult years to do uh, hysterectomies. Oh, another case, another problem is if you have a large uterus and the patient also has uh, previous caesarean sections. So for example, this particular lady had a 28 week size uterus, multiple fibroids, and she had a previous caesarean section. And sometimes you don't know where the bladder is and, uh, and that can make your surgery difficult. This particular case, I actually went into the bladder because I couldn't, I, I didn't know where I was and then subsequently worked my way backwards. So it is, it is, it is, it can be difficult. And finally, of course, we would like to say that the skill of the surgeon, uh, the more skillful the surgeon is, he probably will be able to do ha handle bigger and bigger uteruses. And that's what we do. We start with small uteruses and then we move on to try to tackle bigger and bigger uteruses. Now, uh, in my lecture now, I'm going to look at 16 tips. I'll go quickly go through 16 tips that I've worked out that could benefit anybody who's trying to do laparoscopy uh, for big fibroids. And here are some of the cases that I've done over the years, uh, ranging from one kg to about almost two kg uh, uteruses. Okay, let's me go from one uh, to, to uh, tip number one, using GnRH and agonist prior to surgery. Now, 
uh, many of us can do very big uteruses, but if the uterus can be shrunk a little bit with GnRH analog, your surgery becomes even easier. So I always like to do this. My limit is about 20, 22 week size uterus. Anything beyond, if I could uh, shrink the uterus a little bit to make my surgery uh, bed easier, I will do it. And for example, I'll give you this example of a 43 year old uh, doctor was referred to me by another gynecologist. Uh, she saw me in 2014, August 2014. The uterus was 13, 30 week size. She already had received a, a luprolite injection uh, a, a month earlier. She wanted the surgery to be done laparoscopically. She wanted a laparoscopic myomectomy. I told her that it's too big. It's beyond me. I wanted to refer her to somebody else, but she still insisted. So I gave her a second dose, wait for the, the uh, uterus to shrink. And I saw her again in October. The uterus actually shrunk a little bit. It was about 28 week size. So I gave her a second dose. And then the, the uterus at, at that time actually measured, there were two big fibroids. One was six, 16 by 10 centimeters. The other one was seven by eight centimeters. And then I proceed on to the surgery. So the surgery, because I have given this, uh, this Liprola, she's fortunately a, a, quite a big size lady. So there was space to work. And so here I uh, started the surgery by Hello? using, yes, can you hear me? Uh, so. Dr. Chan, can you hear me? Oh, shit. Dr. Chan, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can keep going. Okay, yeah. okay. Because I, I, I heard somebody say hello, so I, 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 I thought we can't. Okay, I'll move on. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, uh, so I proceed on to the surgery. Let me see whether I can fast forward this. Uh, please tell me if you can't hear me. So, uh, and then the myomectomy was then performed. And uh, so slowly the, the, uh, you, the fibroid was enucleated. And once the fibroid was enucleated, then uh, I proceed on to uh, suturing using a, a, a barb suture and then doing the cirrhosa using a, a polyglactin one suture. So once this, this, uh, this uh, fibroid has been uh, done, completed, I went on to do the other fibroid. I didn't want to do both the fibroids and then suture because of uh, worry of bleeding. So I did the first fibroid first, did all the suturing and then went on to do the second fibroid and then uh, 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 did the suturing of the uterus. So because of this GnRH analog, I was uh, able to successfully do this uh, surgery laparoscopically. So, so my first tip is actually, if it is beyond you, you might want to consider GnRH analog and GnRH analog actually works very well. Even a, a one to two centimeter reduction in the size actually uh, uh, makes a large reduction in volume. Like for example, you will have to spend hours uh, mosellating if, if, if the fibroid is very large. The, this, this uterus actually ultimately, it was 1.5 kg uh, fibroid uterus, uh, fibroids that were removed. So the second uh, tip is choice of instruments. Now, uh, it's, it's nice to have a good uterine manipulator. I know my good friend Prashant will be talking about uh, this uh, later, so I will not uh, uh, talk more on it. Large uteruses, you, your, you, your manipulators may not reach the funder. So having a, a good manipulator helps. Of course, we also like to have all these uh, devices that can coagulate and cut, and this saves us uh, time uh, uh, when we are performing this kind of surgery. So there are many types of instruments. There are Thunderbeard, uh, ligature, uh, and seal. And uh, so all these instruments are useful because in one hand, you will be able to coagulate and cut. And uh, so you it, choosing this kind of instruments can make your surgery easier. So this is my second tip. The third tip is port placements. Uh, you all know that if you have a uterus that is uh, uh, going above the umbilicus, then you will have to have your troca uh, very high up. Uh, this is the Huangli point. And uh, there's one um, uh, gynecologist from India, Dr. Hafiz actually puts even places his uh, trochas right under the right hypochondrium. And this is one of the surgeries that I was watching him do. His uh, troca was right at the hypochondrium because the uterus was so large. So this is something that you can consider. And uh, I, I've actually modified my technique of doing uh, surgery for patients with large uteruses. So what I do is I, I, I place my various needle at the umbilicus and then insufflate the patient. And once the insufflation is done, what I do is I put a five millimeter, this is the insufflation, once the insufflation is done, I place a five millimeter troca right at the level of the umbilicus and then use a five millimeter scope to look into the abdomen. So if I'll go through my first incision, my first troca incision is actually this five millimeter troca. 
So once this camera has gone in, uh, what happens is that I'll use the five millimeter trocar, I'll look into the abdomen, I'll look at the size of the uterus and then decide where the, the camera pod is going to be. I could put it right at the hypochondrium here if I want to, or up here, whichever level that I find that it is. This is the hypochondrium, uh, hypochond uh, below the right hypochondrium. You can even put it up here. So if it's too high up, it's also difficult. Uh, so you want to be in a position that you will be able to have, you are comfortable to perform the surgery. So by direct vision, I place this 10 millimeter trocar. So in this way, I will know where exactly my camera pod is and not be you know, kind of surprised that the camera pod is too high or too low to perform the surgery. So this is another trick in the sense that you must know where to place your troca for your camera pod for performing the surgery. And usually for this kind of big uteruses, you need, you need to be very much higher up. The, third, the, the fourth trick is to use vasopressin. Now we use vasopressin for our myomectomy. So the way in which I inject my vasopressin is I use one ampule, which is 20 units. I mix it with 200 mils of saline, and then I inject it at one spot between the fibroid, the largest fibroid and the uterus. My area, my aim is actually to devascularize the uterus, not the fibroid, so that I can do the myomectomy. Another trick is that you could actually use vasopressin even when you are doing hysterectomy. This is not only for myomectomy because when you inject vasopressin into the uterus of a hysterectomy patient, when you manipulate the uterus, you can have less bleeding from the uterus, as I will show you in a little later. If, so the next trick is actually to use a myoma screw or a myoma spiral. So if you have injected vasopressin, as I showed you in uh, tip number uh, four, if you put in a myoma screw, then there won't be bleeding. Now, the myoma screw is a very in useful instrument, especially if you want to manipulate the uterus. Uh, your uterine manipulator may not be able to manipulate the uterus in a large uterus. Like, for example, in this patient, this myoma screw actually broke while I was, uh, I was uh, doing it. And then I placed another myoma screw. And sometimes I use two myoma, uh, myoma spirals or myoma screws. Uh, one, I'll put it in. And if I'm not happy, I'll put in another one to another pod and then pull until I'm, I, I'm in an ideal position to do the surgery. So consider using myoma spirals when you're doing, uh, when you're, when you're doing uh, surgery for large Please. uteruses. Next, po next uh, tip is use more pods. And we always like to try and do all our surgeries with four pods, one camera pod, two pods for me, and one more pod for, my, for our assistant. But you could consider putting in more pods. For example, in this particular book that I got in, this particular surgeon actually places six pods. Yes, he has three pods on one side and three pods on the other side. So he uses these three pods to do the pedicles on, one, on the left side. And then he uses another three pods to do the pedicles on the other side. So consider putting in another pod and even bringing in another assistant to hold on, for example, a myoma screw or, a, or, a, or even a tenaculum to hold the uterus uh, away for you to do the surgery. So this is my sixth tip. Now, the seventh tip is ligate the uterine arteries first, if you can. Uh, in a big uterus, uh, it is usually very vascular. So if you could get to the uterine arteries, especially the uterine arteries at its origin and tie the uterine arteries up, then you, will de you can devascularize the uterus. Your uterus actually will look smaller because blood doesn't go into the uterus as much. Of course, there's collaterals, there'll be blood coming into the other arteries, but the main arterial supply is affected. So the uterus can become a bit small, your surgery can become easier. Another way in which you can uh, ligate the uterine artery is actually to tie up the ascending branch of the uterine artery. Here you look at the uterine artery and you can see the pulsation and then you can bring in a suture and then actually suture the anterior branch of the uterine artery. So by devascularizing the uterus, your surgery can become easier. Here I'm, here I'm just ligating the anterior branch of the uterine artery and then you can go and uh, uh, suture the uh, right anterior branch of the uterine artery. So here you are, you're, you're ligating the anterior branch of the other uterine artery. And then once you have ligated and the uh, bleeding is lesser, the, the blood supply becomes less, you can proceed with the surgery. So this is my seventh tip. So let's move on to the next tip. So after, after ligating, you can proceed on to the surgery. So the next tip is to perform myomectomy first. Now, many times uh, in a large uterus, you couldn't get to the lower pedicles. You cannot get to the anterior branch of the uterine artery. You cannot get to the cervix. So um, doing a myomectomy will be a choice. So for example, this patient, this particular uterus was 20 centimeters by 10 centimeters. 
and uh, I thought it was it was too big. But after putting in the scope and then slowly dissecting, I realized that it was actually not that a difficult case because what happened is that this large uterus was actually connected to the this large the fibroid was actually connected to the uterus by only a small pedicle. So after all the dissection, it was actually turned out to be a quite a simple case. And, uh, uh, and what, what happened is that this particular case is only a small pedicle holding this huge uterus. So after injecting vasopressin, I could easily detach this uterus, this fibroid from the uterus. And then after that, the surgery becomes easier. So you might want to consider that if you, if you find it is very difficult, you might want to look at one of the fibroids that is blocking your surgery and then do the myomectomy first. And then you can proceed on to your hysterectomy. And then the other trick is to, to remove the cervical fibroid by vaginally. So for example, this particular case, there was a large fibroid sitting in the pouch of Douglas and pushing the pouch of Douglas. So I found that it, it is much easier for me to make a colpotomy and then remove the fibroid through the uh, colpotomy and then proceed on to the surgery laparoscopic. And this is what I was doing for this particular patient. So you could make an incision and actually use your finger and nucleate and take out the fibroid and then you can go on laparoscopically to complete the surgery. So this is another trick that you may want to uh, use when you're performing uh, surgery. Another uh, tip that I would like to point out is you can use your five millimeter laparoscope as an accessory port to look at anatomy. Sometimes when you have a huge uterus with multiple fibroids, you may get lost. So, and you don't know where things are, especially if it's associated with endometriosis and adhesions. Uh, I always have a five millimeter laparoscope uh, with me all the time. So I could use the five millimeter laparoscope. I could put it into the other ports and then look to understand anatomy before uh, proceeding on the surgery. So this is another trick that you could uh, uh, try to use during your surgery. Now, perform subtotal hysterectomy first. Uh, this, is, this video is from uh, a friend of mine, who, uh, late Dr. Rakesh Sinha. He was, he was one of those uh, early people who did uh, all the big, big uteruses. And what he does is that he actually injects uh, vasopressin and then he takes this uh, uh, ut uh, uterine artery bundle at the isthmus uh, first. And then what he does is he ties it up. Uh, this is on the left side. And then this is on the right side. And once this uh, uterine artery, ascending branch of the uterine artery is tied up, then you can easily do a subtotal hysterectomy first. And if you can do the subtotal hysterectomy, then the more difficult part of the surgery, which is at the cardinals and, and the cervix, can then be done easily. As you can see, it's easily detached. Once the uterus is detached, then you can proceed on to do the uh, cervical stump easily and then do the upper pedicles for the uterus. So this is another a trick that you can do, do a subtotal first and then proceed on to the hysterectomy. In situ morselation, if you have successfully tied up both the ascending branch of the uterine artery and you still find that it is difficult, you could consider doing a morselation without the, before the hysterectomy. This is called in situ morselation. So you could do a morselation and reduce the size of the uterus and then proceed on to the hysterectomy. So this is another trick. Now, the next trick is called the reverse technique. This is for patients who have large uteruses, fibroid or adenomyosis, but the whole gut is stuck to the uterus posteriorly. So you could dissect up to the uterine arteries, but beyond you find it very difficult. So what you could do is do this reverse technique. In the reverse technique, what you do is you open up the vagina first and then work your way backwards. Because you have done the uterine arteries, even if you have not done the uterine arteries, you can do a reverse technique. When you open up and then you work your way uh, backwards and peel the uterus out of the uh, rectum. That is what I'm doing for this particular case. Uh, I couldn't get to this area uh, because the uterus was large and I, I, uh, it's difficult to antivert the uterus to get to this space. So I do this reverse technique and then detach the uterus from all these adhesions. So once the uterus is detached, then you can go back and do all the excision of the deep infiltrative and uh, endometriosis. And this is technique is called the reverse technique. Uh, and I first heard it from Michel Canis from France. 
you, you can also do a mini laparotomy or what, you call, what I call as hand-assisted technique or laparoscopic assisted uh, abdominal myomectomy. This is something that I do for a lot of my infertility patients with multiple fibroids. Instead of making a large laparotomy, what I do is I do a laparoscopy first and then I'll remove all the big fibroids. And then once all the big fibroids are out, uh, I would like to try and re remove all the smaller ones, which sometimes is very difficult. So what I will do is I will do a mini laparotomy and then pull out the uterus because the uterus now is smaller. Now that I've removed all the big, uh, big fibroids, I can pull out the uterus. And here you can see that this patient has got a lot of submucous fibroid, which I was not comfortable to do laparoscopically. So after the mini laparotomy, I will pull out the uterus uh, through the mini laparotomy, and then I will remove all the subs, uh, all the sub, uh, small fibroids, and then repair this uterus, and then push the uterus back into the uh, abdominal cavity. So the advantage of this is that uh, you actually save a large incision, of course, but also you ex ex um, you bring the uterus out. It is you're not operating in the pelvic in the abdominal cavity, and so adhesions will be lesser as well. So now you can push the uterus back. And then you can take out all the fibroids, the big fibroids that you have done laparoscopically earlier. And these are the big fibroids that I removed laparoscopically. And then uh, we can do the, the repair. So the other uh, technique is to use V-node assisted. And this video is actually from my, uh, my good friend and teacher, Virapal from uh, Thailand. And this is a large uterus. And what he does, he, he did for this particular case is actually went vaginally first. He went vaginally, he opened up the anterior and posterior colpotomy, and then he ligated the uterine artery vaginally, and then go up to abdomen to do the uh, remaining surgery, to, do, to successfully remove the uterus. So this is something that you can consider. And uh, this is uh, new, uh, V-nodes and vaginal uh, surgery is new. I am also very new to this, and I've uh, started doing it. I've done about uh, probably 30, 34 cases. And... And if you can get this, uh, if you can become good at V nodes, then you can actually salvage some cases. So this is an example of a V node case that I've done, I've done recently. Now this is a small uterus, of course, but you have to start small first, get used to the anatomy, and this is how it is done. You've done an anterior colpotomy, posterior colpotomy, put in your put in the uh, loop inside uh, the wound retractor, and then you can actually uh, take the pedicles from vaginally. And you be based on this. Uh, experience that I have, if I could uh, salvage some patients whom I couldn't get the uterines from uh, laparoscopy by this V-node technique. And finally, my last uh, trick for you all is that uh, gasless laparoscopy. I think this is coming into vogue now, now that uh, people are worried about using, uh, about doing uh, carbon dioxide laparoscopy for cancer patients. So this is, I, I am not an expert in gasless. I've not done gasless, but I'm looking at possibility of bringing this into my OT practice so that some of these large uteruses can be salvaged using gasless laparoscopy. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I have given you 16 uh, tricks uh, as to how to deal with uteruses that are large. I think many of these, uh, my subsequent speakers will be talking on and elaborating on it. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Chan.